All right, well, we're here. We've made it to Bible study, and I'm so glad to see you. How's everyone feeling with everything? Good? Okay, we raised some questions last week, and I sent, well, uh, the women's ministry team sent you a video. So if you have any questions about heaven and afterlife, you've got a little 15-minute video waiting for you in your inbox from yours truly. I apologize. I don't know brevity. So it's 15 minutes long, but it's thorough. It's thorough. Okay, show of hands. Who are my A&M folks? Yeah. Anybody in here have uh, someone in the core in their sphere of loved ones? I know you do, Karen. Is Karen the only one? No more core people? Okay, well, this... so. Not born and raised in Texas, got here fast as I could, but I had never heard, not also not that big of a college sports person, so um, I just had never really heard of the Aggies or A&M and the whole experience down in College Station, but I started working at 99.5 The Wolf back in 99, I think, and... Um, did a, a night show with another girl. We were called Night Wolf with Mel and Rebecca. And my co-host, Mel, her name is Melinda, she was dating. She had this hunky boyfriend who um, was an Aggie. And he had been in the court. And I found that out very early on because that is a badge of honor that I did not realize. But it is such a badge of honor. So, And he was so all in. Like he and his core buddies had stayed in touch, um, you know, for the decades since he'd been in college and they would, when there was a home game, there was always a group of them that would go down and tailgate and do the whole thing together. And then when Melinda got engaged, I remember she went and she took her bridal shots down on the stairway. Is it the stairway at AM? Do you know what I'm talking about? On the steps. On the steps. Yeah, 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 the steps. And so she had like all the core guys there. She made a phone call or something. And they all like got all dressed up in their dressy uniforms, and they held their swords up like this, and like, so she was under all their swords in this very big dramatic wedding gown. It was very, very impressive. Um, and I've got a really good friend whose son is in the Corps, so I'm having the whole um, vicarious core experience all over again. And as I've been thinking, because our study is called Living Beloved, and what does it mean to be living beloved? It means this beautiful koinonia fellowship that we're called into, right? And so as I've been thinking and meditating on this Koinonia Fellowship that we're called into, I just keep thinking of the core and how it is this, it's this bigger than life thing. So how do you know, if you're a student at AM, how do you know who is in the core and who's not in the core? Uniform, right? The way they dress. Um, the way they behave. They are called to a, a certain code of conduct. They all sit together at the games. Um, when you are a, a member of the Corps of Cadets, are you, is the idea that you would blend in or stick out? Yeah, you're supposed to stick out. You're supposed to stick out. Why? Because it's a really big deal to belong to the core. And in a way, the core paints, paints this ideal picture of the a and ideal, what A&M represents. And so you and I, as we think about this, I want you to constantly be thinking about how you are part of something bigger than just you and the people you run with and your family of origin. You are part of something, like if you're a cadet, if you're a, if you're a member of the core, you can see any other core member from any other decade in any other place on the planet, and there is automatically this bond, right? Because they had this big, shared, common experience. And that is what God wants us to know that we're a part of. And God does not want us to blend in. God wants us to stick out like the Corps of Cadets on the A&M campus. And, and here's the thing, as you read through your homework, and as you read through the text and did your homework, um, I imagine, just like it did for me, some of you thought, God, this thing we're called to is kind of hard. <laughs> it is hard, right? Like, the Christian walk, the Christian life is hard. There are 
standards we hold ourselves to, that we are held to, that the rest of the world just, they just don't have to play by the same rules. And so it's really hard. And so just like how A&M paints this really robust ideal of what it means to be a member of the Corps of Cadets, that's what John wants to do for us. He wants to paint this beautiful, vivid, in living color portrait of what it means to belong to this koinonia fellowship, to the sisterhood, brotherhood, to the family of Christ. And and as we keep that picture in front of us, God is going to empower us. He's going to give us the will and the desire to do everything that he calls us to do. Okay, let's go to verse one, chapter three. We're going to camp on this verse for a little while. Okay, it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. Okay, I want to point something out to you that's not going to show up in your English translation. So do you remember last week how we talked about indicative verbs and imperative verbs? And you remember how indicative verbs just kind of indicate the way things are? They're stative verbs, like this is a Bible, is, is an indicative verb word. This podium stands on the stage. I'm not telling it to do anything. I'm just telling you something about it. And that is like the whole first chapter and a half of John's letters. He's just painting a picture for us. But then last week, he started getting into the imperatives, like it's imperative that you do this. That's more command language or pleading language. Well, we're, this is actually our fifth imperative, It's really obvious in the Greek. It's not at all obvious in the English language. But what were our imperatives? What are the things that John really wants us to do? The first one was do not love the world. It was a negation. The second one was let God's word abide in you or remain in you. And then the third and the fourth one were the same. Abide in him, remain in him. And then this is the fifth one. It's a command to see. It's a command to behold. And if you read it in the Greek, it actually says, behold, what kind of love the Father has given to us. This is the Greek word, idon. And it's not just look. It's not just see like I see the exit sign over there. It means to see about, to consider, to take your time and to think about it and to turn it over in your mind. It means to look into. There's an experiential element of this. He's saying, don't just see what kind of love, step into this kind of love that the Father has for you. Experience it, examine it, study it. And so what is the picture that John wants us to hang in the walls of our mind? It's this kind of love that the Father has for us, that we should be called children of God. Now, I know I'm getting so picky. I'm so sorry. No, I'm not. This is what I love to do. Okay. I want you to look at the the tense of the word to give. It says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. Okay. So last week or the week before, we talked about tenses of verbs, right? And so we have the past tense, she threw the ball. We have present tense, she throws the ball. We have future, she will throw the ball. This is in the perfect tense, has given. It does not carry the same weight in English as it does in Greek, and that's why I'm highlighting it for you. So what does the perfect tense represent in Greek? It means that something that happened a long time ago is still having ripple effects. So that earthquake that happened half a world away is still having ripple effects as the waves hit the Pacific coast, right? That's exactly what's going on. And that's exactly the picture I think John is painting for us. The love the Father has given to us happened at one point in time, and we are still riding the tidal wave of it. And what was that? What was that moment? When did God give us this love that he has for us? Yeah, when Jesus went to the cross. The cross is God's great, big, giant, I love you. I love you. And anytime you feel lonely, you can look at the cross and what you can hear in your mind is God saying, I love you. Anytime you blow it, 
you can look at the cross and God is still saying, I love you. I love you. It's the great, I love you. And now I wanna direct your attention to the words, what kind of, what kind of love? This is such a cool word. We don't even have an English equivalent, all right? It's the word potapos, potapos, and it can be translated of what manner, but it, what it carries is this element of otherness. Um, its original translation means of what country? So it's got, it's got this element of, it ain't from around here, but that's not all. It's got this, this foreign flavor to it, this alienness, this otherness, but it also carries this, this big sense of like awe and wonder. Like what even is this? It ain't from around here, all right? It ain't from around here. And so the answer to John's question, see what kind of love, what kind of love? It ain't from around here. It is totally foreign to us. God's love is other love. And you and I, we, we just can't wrap our minds around it because we're not God and we don't think like God. And the reason we struggle with God's love for us is because the only thing we have to compare it to is our love that we give. And even the person that we love the most in the entire world, there are still conditions to that love. There are still conditions to that love. And so what John is going to do as he's trying to describe this um, potapos love, this what the heck is it kind of love, is he's going to get us as close as he can possibly get and tell us that we're God's children, all right? But even that doesn't quite capture it because you were not loved perfectly by your parents, and if you are a parent, you don't love your children perfectly. But God loves you perfectly. He loves you with a what the heck is this, it ain't from around here kind of love. And there's more. John writes, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. Okay, I have a friend here and I'm gonna totally embarrass her. And she can't do anything about it because she's staying with me right now. <laughs> Janae, wave to everybody. There she is. It's my beautiful friend, Janae. Janae is staying with us for a spell, and it's been a delight to have her. Um, the best part of this whole thing for me has been how quickly my kids took to her. I mean, there's just this is a picture of her playing um, video games. She's doing Oculus with my son, Nick. A couple of you know my son, Nick, and um, like he fell in love with Janae instantly, and that has never happened before, ever, ever. Um, but she goes to my son's baseball games, and she gets her nails done with my daughter, and she runs them around if I'm working on something, and they call her Aunt Janae, and they totally love her. Now, let me ask you a question. Is she truly their aunt? I mean, I wish, but in order for her to actually be their aunt, we would have to be, you know, there'd have to be a blood relationship or a legal contract somewhere in the mix. And she is neither married to a family member, nor does she come from the same set of parents that I do. So um, do we consider her family? Totally. Absolutely. She is my sister. My kids call her aunt, but they call her aunt. If we wanted to make this a real and permanent thing, there would have to be some marriages or some contracts or something that would have to go on. So we call her their aunt. But look at this. This says, see what kind of love the father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are you see, God doesn't just call you his child. He has made you his child. And so what's going on here is um, John's writing to believers in Ephesus, okay? And this is going to circulate throughout the Roman Empire. This is a Greco-Roman first century world. And so the picture that John's audience has in their mind is one of Roman adoption, 
Now, in Ephesians 1, Paul tells us that we are adopted into sonship. We're adopted into sonship. And I'm hanging on to the gender-specific nature of sonship for a, a very good reason. I'm all about gender um, proper pronouns in the scriptures. And quite honestly, my beef with the ESV is a good translation, but where they say brothers, it should say brothers and sisters. Um, and there's always a footnote that says this, this also means brothers and sisters. So I'm all about brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, except I want to hang on to sonship. Let me tell you why. Um, in Greco-Roman culture, girls were almost never adopted. Babies were almost never adopted children were very, very rarely adopted. Do you know who was adopted? Young men or grown men. Do you know why they were adopted? It's not because someone couldn't have a son. Well, it might be, but technically it had less to do with fertility. Well, I guess it would have to do with fertility, but it had more to do with passing on an inheritance. And so the Romans adopted men to be their heir. And if they had sons, and they didn't want their sons to be an heir, they would adopt someone else and the father's estate would go to that person. Now, listen to this. Like I just told you, a father could totally cut his biologicals out of the inheritance. He could send them out of the household, he could write them out of the will, but not an adopted child. In fact, when you were adopted, you stood before a judge, there had to be seven witnesses, it was this big ordeal done in a very public fashion. And what the judge did is he ceremoniously erased your prior life as though it didn't even exist. And you began a new life with a new name and a new family from the moment of your adoption. And they could never cut you out of the will or send you from the house. God has made you his child. He has made you his child. Okay, why am I sticking with the adopted into sonship instead of adopted as children? Who had the greatest priority in a Greco-Roman household after the patriarch? The sons. The sons. And sisters, you're adopted into sonship. Full-blown inheritance. Full rights as heir. Full blown adoption into God's family. And this would have meant a whole lot more to a first century audience than it does. But to be adopted as a son, that's what we are in a, it, John wrote this in a super patriarchal society and he wrote it for women too. I just think that's really cool. Okay. So God doesn't just call us children, he adopts us into sonship. Male and female alike have all of the privileges of sonship. And then it says this, the reason why the world does not know us is that it didn't know him, who? Jesus. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So John said, see what kind of love the Father has given us. And that's the potapas word, the what kind of, this whole otherness. And now he is carrying over this concept to describe what we will be like when Jesus comes back. He doesn't even really hedge a whole, you know, he doesn't really hedge much of a guess. He's just like, we don't even know, but we'll be like him. And he ain't from around here, okay? And so, but, but we do have clues. We do have a glimpse. Um, there is a section, there's a little narrative in the Gospels, in three of them, where Jesus goes up on what is called, what the Gospel authors called, the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is what happens in Luke 11, 28, 29. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as Jesus was pray, uh, praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white and they got a glimpse of Jesus in his glory. What will we be like? I don't know, but we will be 
like him. After the crucifixion, Jesus appeared to the disciples numerous times, um, and several of those times, they don't even recognize him at first. Like, it takes them a minute to see that it's Jesus. He can appear and disappear, but he has a fully material body because he has Thomas touch the scars in his hands and put his hand in the wound in his side. He eats fish with them on the shore of Galilee. And so what will we be like? It ain't from around here, but we will have glorified bodies. We may or may not be able to teleport. I'm kind of hoping we can. I think that sounds cool. Um, But we will eat and we will have a physical body that looks like us, but more than us. Friend of mine lost her husband not long ago. And she had a very powerful dream a couple weeks after he passed. And she said that she saw him. And not only was he alive, he was more alive than he had ever been. He was more, and that's what we're going to be, more alive than we've ever been. All right, it says, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Okay, so what I'm highlighting here for you, obviously, is that we have this theme going on of seeing, of visibility, Right, And remember, I told you that what, what John wants to do so that we can live this core of cadets Christian lifestyle is he wants you to have a better picture. He wants you to have a more vivid picture of your true and better reality. And so um, in the first verse, we had see what kind of love. And now John has mentioned appearing twice and seeing again. And I love what your homework had to say about eye contact. I don't know if y'all got to it this week, but I I pulled the quote because I thought it was so good. It says, there is something transformative about eye contact. People who spend a lot of time looking at one another sometimes come to resemble each other. Perhaps this is because they are instinctively copying one another's facial expressions until their muscles and tissue begin to be reshaped that way. So there is a general principle that we become like we, what we behold. We start to kind of morph into the people that we spend the most amount of time with. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have any of you ever just had a really, like the kind of friend that when they walk into the room, like everybody knows they're there and they're this really strong personality. And before you even know what you're doing, you're saying all the things she says and you're doing things just like her. We all do it. It is human nature. Maybe some of you don't, but surely one of you has had a middle school daughter. A daughter. I mean, it's like, what, two weeks at middle school and they come back and they're like, oh my gosh, this, this. And it's like, what just happened to my darling? She is speaking another language and she's doing different things and she wants to wear her hair a different way and she wants to dress a different way. It's because we become what we behold. Whatever it is we're setting our affections on, we start to emulate that. We all do it. Where was I going with that? I had a really big point to that. Oh, okay. So keeping Jesus in our line of sight morphs us into his image where we start to resemble him and we start to love what he loves and hate what he hates. And the very act of keeping this picture in our minds is a cleansing agent in us. It cleanses us. Verse four, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. At our leadership meeting before this, one of um, your leaders was reading from the Passion Translation. Oh my gosh, this is how they described it. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices moral anarchy. Isn't that good? Moral anarchy, that is so descriptive. It says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. How do we know? Because we become what we behold, and you cannot sit there transformed 
fixed on something and not begin to imitate it after a time. And so what's going on here, and, and there are commentators who disagree with me. I always want you to go back and, and you know do your own study, but I will tell you, and there are plenty of commentators who agree, John is taking a swing at the Gnostics. He's taking another swing at the Gnostics because this is the kind of stuff they did. I found this fabulous quote that I had not come across until this week, and I wanted to read it to you. William Barclay says this about the Gnostics. They said that the truly spiritual man is so armored with the spirit that he can sin to his heart's content and take no harm from it. They even said that the true Gnostic, the man with True knowledge must know both the heights of virtue and the depths of sin. Oh, he is under obligation to both scale the heights and plumb the depths so that he may be truly said to know all things. Okay, if John's not swinging at the Gnostics, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but what he is also doing here is he is giving the believers a litmus test. And since we are not running around in first century circles with Gnostics, you know, trying to lead us astray, um, this is a very good litmus test for us. If someone is breaking the law and living in gross immorality and has absolutely no problem with it and is like, I'm a total Christian, I am a total Christian. John suggests that perhaps you're not. John is going to want a word or two with you. John, in fact, is going to argue that it is impossible for a true Jesus follower to continue to engage in that kind of lifestyle. He says this, Little children, let no one deceive you. The Gnostics were trying to deceive them. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil. And you'll notice that I put a Switzerland flag up there. Why did I do that? Because no one gets to play Switzerland in God's economy. There is no neutral ground. There is no neutral ground. Um, in Matthew 12, 30, Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me. And that word is a pushing against. No, I'm just living my life. No, you're not. Because there is no neutral ground. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. 1 John 3, 5 says that Jesus appeared in order to take away sin. And here in verse 8, it says the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. So what is going on here? If the Son of God appeared to take away sin and to destroy the works of the devil, what are we doing when we just refuse to do things God's way? We're undoing Jesus' work. He came to earth, I'm going to get salty for a second, to get the hell out of earth. <laughs> he came to earth to get the hell out of earth and the hell out of us. And so if we refuse to align ourselves with him, we are working for the kingdom of darkness. We're doing the enemy's work and we are actively undoing what Jesus came to do and is doing right now. John, uh, 1 John 3, 9 through 10, and you'll notice John's making kind of a loop-de-loop -loop back to some things that he touched on in the second chapter. He says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Okay, so what are we supposed to do with this? Because the weight of the gospel is always supposed to convict us, but it's not supposed to crush us. I don't need to pull the room to know that no one came in here batting a thousand. Like, None of us walked in with a clean slate today. We've already had our negative thoughts and we've already been bitter about something and frustrated about something. And chances are we've already gotten sharp with someone and if not by words, we felt it in our heart. 
So John's not talking about that. John's talking about the person who couldn't care less. They're going to do what they want to do, and they just don't care what anyone has to say about it. You know someone like that. You know someone like that. What does it mean that God's seed abides in us? I don't want to dwell on this too much. I think the best explanation for this, if you think back to um, one of Jesus' story that he tells in a couple of his gospels is the parable of the sower. And the nature of the parable goes like this. A farmer went out sowing his seed and he scattered it all over the place. And some fell on the path and the birds came and plucked it up. And then some fa- fell on rocky ground and the seed couldn't take root. And then some fell in thorns and the thorns choked it and the seeds died. But then some seed fell on good ground and it grew and it yielded a crop of 30, 60, or 100. So Jesus explains that parable and he says, the seed is the word of God and the soil is your heart. So I think we can just very safely assume that John remembered Jesus' teaching and the seed, God's seed is God's word in our heart. Um, Okay, so who are the ones who have the seed of God in them? the ones who let the word of God abide in them, the ones who keep this beautiful, what kind of love is this picture hanging in the walls of their minds. The ones John calls children of the devil are not the ones who are just slipping up every now and then. They're the ones who enjoy it and keep on doing it and have absolutely no interest in changing their ways. And then we've talked about how much John loves the book of Genesis. John goes back to his favorite book to illustrate his point. He says, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. So Cain and Abel, if you're not familiar with the story, were Adam and Eve's first two sons. Cain was older, uh, Abel was younger, and you can read it for yourself in Genesis chapter four, but it says that as a sacrifice, Cain brought some of his yield. He brought some of the fruit of his crop, but it says that Abel brought the best portion with the fat portions. He brought his first fruits and he brought the best that he had. And so God looked on favorably toward Abel's sacrifice and on Cain's sacrifice, he did not look on favorably. And so Cain got jealous and then he hated his brother and then he murdered his brother. And so that's, that's what's going on here. John tells us that Abel's motives were righteous, but Cain's were evil. And because of that, Cain hated him. Let me ask you a question. Why do the bullies tend to always pick on the really good kids? Put on a psychologist hat and tell me what you think. I think it's probably because they make them feel guilty. (laughs) You know, they pick on them because they're not like them. And so they get other people who are like them. And then they pick on the poor kids who never do anything wrong. I cannot tell you how many friends I lost when I stopped drinking 13 years ago and how many things I stopped getting invited to when I went into ministry. I am, it's not a pity party. I love my life. However, when you start to attempt to live your life a certain way, certain people are not going to enjoy it. And that which loves the dark is not going to appreciate it when the light shines on it. And one of the reasons that John is so passionate about calling us into this belonging, this koinonia fellowship, this thing that's bigger than all of us is because if we are gonna stand for Christ, if we are going to be beacons of light in a world like ours, we're sure, as I almost said heck, but I feel like I shouldn't say that in Bible study, but I already said hell, so I might as well. We're sure as heck not gonna be able to do it alone, right? We're not gonna be able to do this alone. And so John's like, you need each other. You need each other. You need each other to strengthen each other. Do you, how long do you think a uh, corps cadet would last if he was the only one? <laughs> the only one? Probably not very long. But when there's a whole troop of you and you have each other's backs and you're there for each other and you have this bond that cannot be broken by time or space, you can do anything. 
right? Jesus warned his disciples over and over that the world would hate them because it hated him first. And we need each other so that we can strengthen each other and so we can stand together. 314, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, and let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So there is a principle that is true, and it's this. I've said it before. I'm sure you've heard me say it before. Behavior betrays belief. And John's just hammering that home. Behavior be- betrays belief. What does that person believe? Well, let's just look at their behavior for a little while. I'll tell you what they believe. I can probably tell you who they vote for. I can probably tell you all kinds of things about them. But I can, if I have enough time with someone without asking a whole lot of probing questions, if I just have time to spend with someone, I can, I can probably tell you a lot about what gets them going and what makes them tick and why they do the things they do. Um, and so what, what do we do when someone's behavior is off? There's two methods. You can either just punish the behavior and punish the behavior and punish the behavior or you can go after their belief because behavior betrays belief. And if we have faulty behavior, there's a really good chance we have some faulty belief that needs to be attended to. And that's why John's going after our hearts. That's why John was so furious with the Gnostics because he was going right at his his congregants' belief. And he's not gonna let them do that. And that's why John wants you to have this beautiful love Jesus picture hanging in your mind at all times. Because if you can actually start to believe that God loves you with this, what is this not from around here kind of love? And if you can live in that every single day and saturate yourself in it and allow it to penetrate your poor self-worth, you are going to change you're going to be a different person. There is a very, um, there's a scientific principle about the healing powers of love. You know that an infant cannot thrive without love and nurturing. And so John is going straight to our belief. Listen, I know why you're doing what you do. It's not because of this over here. It's because we've got a belief problem. Every behavior problem is at its root a belief problem. And this is what John is going to do in the last verses of this chapter. By this, we shall know we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. 2,000 years ago, God said, I love you in such an earth shattering way that 2000 years later, that tidal wave has not even begun to slow down. It's only increasing in intensity. And he knows everything. He knows everything you think. He knows everything you've done, everything. And he's saying, child, I love you. I love you. But God, I did this. I know. I love you. But you don't know if you only knew. I do know. I know better than you know. Remember, he sees the hurts you can't remember that cause the behavior you can't explain. And he loves you. And the next time you doubt it, you look at that cross and all you have to say is, I love you too. I love you too. The Passion Translation said, whenever our heart condemns us, God is much greater and more merciful than our conscience. Your conscience is terribly unmerciful to you. And God is much greater 
and much more merciful than your conscience. And he knows everything. He sees every broken, tender spot in your heart that needs healing, and he does not condemn you. So when your conscience condemns you, you speak the gospel to your conscience. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. I told the ladies beforehand, I really wish John wouldn't have said this. This is very challenging because a lot of us are going, well, then where is it? Because I've prayed for this and I prayed for this and I prayed for this and you didn't give it to me. Okay, we're going to take a minute. We're going to unpack it and then we're going to wrap. This is a second class conditional sentence in Greek which means that this front half is not true. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, and you know it does, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So this is a posture thing. When our heart and when our hands are in alignment with God, meaning when we are aligning our will with his and doing what he says, then we are positioned, then and only then are we positioned to really pray alongside his will. And Jesus has shown us what that looks like. He's the only person that ever did it perfectly. And he gave us the prayer. He said, pray like this then. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Glorify your name, Lord. Your kingdom come. Do it your way, God. Your will be done on earth, in my house, at my office. Your will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. And then we can ask for provision and that God would forgive us. And we forgive those who have sinned against us. And God will answer this prayer with a yes and amen every single time. If you ask him to have his way with you, he will do it. If, he, if you ask him to make him the greatest thing in your life, he will do it. He cannot not answer that prayer. And the biggest evidence of where we are with the Lord is always where we are with one another. How well we are walking with the Lord vertically always manifests itself horizontally. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. That's all we have to do. That's all we have to do. Just as he commanded us, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Let's revisit the core. Yeah, this group of students who are in like this pocket of life that is so fun and so exciting and you're finally out from underneath mom and dad's thumb and no one's telling you to go to class and no one's telling you what to eat and no one's telling you to go to bed. And what do they do? They put themselves in a situation where they're telling them what to eat and telling them how to dress and telling them when to go to bed and telling them when to study and telling them what... Why? Why would you do that when you are 18 years old? I need someone to tell me why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because they believe for a better life later. They believe for a better life later, and they've been given a better vision now. God wants us to have a better life later. And so he's given us a beautiful vision now. 
Cadets in the Corps live a disciplined lifestyle while gaining practical experience in leadership and organizational management. The Corps of, of Cadets has many programs that are specifically designed to prepare cadets for leadership roles in the military, corporate America, government service, and the private sector. The unique spirit and traditions that make Texas A&M so special are deeply rooted in the Corps of Cadets experience. For that reason, the Corps has long been regarded as the keepers of the spirit and the guardians of tradition of Aggieland. We are the keepers of the spirit and the guardians of the traditions of the creator of the universe. And that is the picture, that is the picture that John wants to leave you with. You are loved with a what the heck is it kind of love and you'll never be able to get it. So just look at the cross anytime you need a reminder. Here are your questions for reflection. In what ways can I lay down my life for a sister or brother to show Potipas love? I doubt anyone in this room is ever going to be in a situation where they need to give up their life for someone else, but there are a million ways we can do it in the day to day. And where in my heart is there separation between me and my creator? Where am I harboring pockets of hurt, pockets of anger, pockets of jealousy, and pockets of unforgiveness? Beholding the face of Christ will cleanse you of that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your word and we thank you for this potapos love that we can't even figure out that our language doesn't even have a word for. That's amazing, God, it's insane. Thank you for loving us so much. Help us to take the love that you give us and splash it around on everyone around us, Lord. Help us to be potapos Christians who stand out by the way that we love each other. Lord, I pray for our discussions this evening. And I pray, I pray that every woman here tonight would feel so cherished and, and, and so seen and so loved. We love you, Father. We love you too. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.